morning, I, I'm going to share something from my heart. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about what? Exactly. <laughs> digging ditches. We talked about digging ditches, and you can go back on our church app and rewatch it. Um, and I pray that that was a powerful sermon that God would just use to advance your walk with Christ. Also, if you are new here or you haven't been here, we did launch a church app. So the permission I'll give you to use your phone is if you're taking notes on the church app. You can go to the notes section. Look at that. Uh, Michelle has it all ready to go. Um, the notes are active and live. You can go on the church app, go over to more, and go to notes, and you can follow along. There's not a whole lot of notes as there's normally been because I left a lot of blank space for you to fill out, all right? I want you to fill in some stuff this morning about what God's speaking to you and not so much just kind of let me fill it all in for you. Sound good? All right. Well, this morning we're going to talk about milk or meat. Turn to your neighbor and say, got milk? Turn to your other neighbor and say, you got any meat? Got any meat. I'm going to pray this morning, and then we're going to dive in for the next three hours into milk or meat. Got to do what we got to do, you know what I'm saying? Y'all didn't remember Y'all didn't remember what we talked about last week, so I need to go a bit longer, see if y'all remember. All right. Oh, let's pray this morning, and we're going to dive in to milk or meat. God, I pray this morning over these next couple moments, God, would you speak to our hearts, steady our minds. Let's be fixed on your word, not ours. This isn't my word or someone else's word. God, this is yours. So I pray, God, by the authority of your word, would you speak to hearts this morning. Open minds, and let us hear what you're speaking to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If not, I got the, the big screen Bible. If you got your iPhone or, or Android or whatever, the scripture's on the um, app as well. But I just want to set this up for one moment, and I'm going to read um, a quick passage of scripture this morning. Um, so you can go back to my graphic for a moment. We'll, we'll wait uh, to show that scripture in just a moment. I'm going to set this up. So in the Bible, there's a lot of talk about your walk with God. Did you know that? There's a lot of, like, a lot of the New Testament this guy, Paul, wrote a lot of the New Testament, and he writes specifically to churches, and he writes to them to help them grow in their walk with God. Areas that they're weak in, he writes specifically to those areas. And he writes to them to help them, some would say, mature in their walk with God. Now, my title this morning is called Milk or Meat. It sounds a little funny, sounds a little childish, sounds a little, well, well is this even going to be a serious sermon? Yeah. Because the Bible talks about milk and meat. Did you know that? It doesn't just talk about it in the Old Testament when they sacrificed meat or, or, or gave up an offering to the Lord. In the New Testament, Paul writes to different people, and he talks about comparing milk to meat. And here's, I'll try to compare it real fast, and we'll dive into our scripture. How many of you guys know when you're a baby, a lot of times you, you're, 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 on the, you're on the milk, right? You ever, you, all of us here at some point weren't infant, and we were on what we call the milk, right? The milk diet. <laughs> Well, at some point, there's, there's a transfer, right? If we, got, we got some moms here this morning, so they understand. A lot of moms who maybe are older, your kids are older, you still remember back. There's a transfer from when your kid not just wants milk anymore, but they're able to start kind of on the solid foods, right? You kind of start them slow, and then eventually they get that one taste for that certain solid food you gave them, and they're like, I love it! Give me more! I don't want the milk! Give me more, right? And eventually your kids get into, like, elementary school, and all they want is candy and all of that solid food, right? Forget the milk, forget the water, I just want the candy, right? So just in life, how, how we, we, we grow and we mature, right? If all of us just drank milk all our life, we wouldn't make it very far. Thank God for meat, right? Thank God for a good steak. Thank God for all the pleasures that we have and being able to enjoy. But in the Bible, there's a transfer from when someone is spiritually what we call growing with God and someone that starts to mature or mature in their faith. How many of you guys know God doesn't just want to save you to stay a baby Christian? He wants you to get grown up and learn how to follow his decrees and laws and to learn how to live more like Jesus. Now, as a pastor, there's a transfer in my job. Did you know that? Some people in church this morning, they aren't following Christ. And guess what? My job as a pastor is to go on what we call the milk diet. Like we start, we don't, we don't start super deep. We start in, in the context of what God's called us to do as, as a newborn Christian. But then there's a transfer for some of us here this morning. If you, if you say, Pastor, I've been saved for 7, 8, 10, 12, 30, 40, 80 years. I can I tell you what? There's a transfer from the small foods to the big stuff. And this morning, I want to read a portion of Scripture, and I want to try to break apart some things I believe God's calling 
us as a church? Because we got people in here who just need milk. Meaning you're, 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 you're kind of new to the walk of faith. You're new to following Jesus. And God wants to start you off. But then some of you guys, you've been serving God for a while, but you're still on the milk. And God wants to transfer you over to the meat with the big boys. Sound good? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is Paul writing. He's writing to a church. This church he had visited and planted. Well, he left the church because he had to go and follow God's, God's leading and go and, and, and continue his missionary journey. Well, while he's gone, he writes a letter back to the church. And when he writes the letter back to the church, we're jumping into chapter 3, which is kind of in the middle of the letter. But I want you to catch what he writes back to this church, all right? And this is what he said. And he said, I, meaning Paul, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. Carnal meaning people of this world, people who, who, who aren't spiritual people. And watch, even goes deeper, as to babes in Christ. Now, it's okay to be a babe in Christ, but it's understanding the transfer that God wants to have in your life. Right? Just as we don't stay babies forever, we get grown up, right? At some age, you know what my dad said when I turned 18? He said, you know, I'm not kicking you out of the house, but you better learn how to do it on your own because I won't be here forever. And he was right. And I'm thankful. Some of us in our spiritual walk, we haven't left the house yet. We're still tied up. We're still, we're still bound by simple things. Once God's calling us to spiritual, what I call maturity. So watch this. Verse 2, I fed you with milk. Not with solid food. Another portion of scripture says meat. For until now, you were not able to what? What's that word? Receive it. Even now, you are still not able to. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and what? Divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So, so look at what Paul's saying here. He's saying, I came to you, and, and, and basically I planted this church, and you just needed milk because you were new in the walk, right? So, so I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't feed you the meat. I gave you, the, someone say, the milk. But Paul's saying, there's been time now. Like time has gone by, and you're still where you're at. There's been no growth, no spiritual growth, no, no, no spiritual walk with God. It's still where it was when I left you. So Paul says, I'm a little hardened. Because you're still as if you're babes with Christ. And I was praying that you would be growing and being able. Because here's the thing. If we all stayed babes in Christ, the world would not know of Jesus because we all would be stuck and still trying to follow Jesus. Are you with me? The reason why we follow Jesus is because it's a transformation. And not only do we transform and God transfers our life, but then it's to pour back into others. But some of us aren't even ready to pour into others because you yourself aren't even mature. And so I want to challenge you this morning. Maybe you're new in your walk with Christ. Don't, don't, don't just be excited in that mere season. Because I was excited when I first got saved. Many other people were excited. There's like an awesome, like what I call hide that comes from receiving Christ. It's awesome. But then there's this walk with Christ over a series of time that matures us and we grow in our walk. Where we don't stay a baby anymore, we grow up. And some of, and I felt this hard in my heart this morning, especially even this week as I was praying and studying, that there are some of you this morning that would raise your hand and say, Pastor, I've been saved for over eight, ten years. But you're still in the infancy stage of your spiritual walk. And it doesn't break my heart. I believe it really breaks God's heart. Because there's a world he's called us to reach. And how are we supposed to reach it if we can't even allow Christ to fully reach us? So Paul said, I came to you. And I fed you as infants because that's what you were. But he said, now some time has gone by and I'm writing to you because you're still, in a way, spiritual babes. And he goes on to list three things that qualified them for being spiritual babes. And I want to highlight three things this morning. And I believe these three things we all struggle with, but it's a sign of whether you're still a babe or if you're willing to walk in spiritual maturity you need to learn how to walk over these three things. So Paul lists out three things, and we're going to go over them this morning. The first one he says is envy. He says what? Believing like mere men. Because what? Where there's envy, where there's strife and division among you, are you still not carnal? Meaning you're still struggling. 
Not so much, now we look at struggling as, well, pastor, I overcame addiction. Pastor, I overcame my, my porn addiction. Pastor, I overcame these things. That's awesome. I cheer with you. I'm excited. But then there's, there's the big stuff that doesn't come up a lot of times in our walk with God that we like to come in the line. And so I want to go over these three this morning, and I pray God will speak to you. If you struggle with any of these three things, I pray this morning there is a power of release in this room that God wants to release a freedom of these things because he wants to get you from a babe, someone say, to a mature Christian. So here's my first one. Someone say envy. Envy. Now, envy is, is, is a big word. It's a small word, but it's really a big word. And I think a lot of times we, we look at the word envy and we kind of say, well, I really don't envy anyone or anything. I want to give you the definition real fast and I want to dive in deeper, the spiritual thought of envy. Here's what the definition of envy means if you look it up in the dictionary. A feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possession, qualities, or luck. Now, the second half of that is a pretty like common definition. Well, pastor, I don't envy my neighbor. I don't envy what other people have. I'm kind of doing me. I do me, boo, right? I do me, I do me. But I think a lot of people could relate with this thought of a feeling of discontent. I mean, you're not content with the life God's given you. You're not content with who he's made you to be. If I asked you this morning, if I brought you up and interviewed you, you maybe could say to us, I love this life I've given you. But you go home at night and you go home and you think and contemplate, I hate this life. I want you to think about this this morning. Think about this. Paul's saying where there's envy, there's still spiritual growth needed. Now, you don't ever stop growing as a Christian. Even as a pastor, I'm still growing. Many people have been saved longer than I have in this church. They're still growing. But I want you to think this is the spiritual base, basic kind of stepladder. Do you still envy? Are you carrying envy in your heart, pastor? I hate this life. Well, let me tell you what. Then you really don't know who you are in Christ. Because when Christ sets someone free, he sets them free from the bounds of this world, meaning envy is something of being, you're discontent with life. And can I tell you what? The devil loves to make you discontent. He likes you to look around on, on, on maybe social media. He likes you to walk the neighborhood and look at what others have and say, man, if I only had what they had, if I only was like that person. Can I tell you what? You don't always realize what you ask for. You want me to tell you why? Someone say why. When I, was, when I was younger, I battled back and forth with wanting to be a pastor. I always wanted to be a pastor, and I battled back and forth with it. Well, at some point, I accepted it, and I said, I want to be a pastor. And I would talk to friends about it. I would pray about it. Then I became a pastor, and I realized, did I really want to be a pastor? And I tell you, not because I don't love it. I love what I do. But what sometimes we don't realize what someone else has, if you would have it, it would tear your life apart. Are you with me? If you can't learn to be content with who God made you to be, you want what other people have. What they have, you may not have the calling to sustain that. Sometimes we look at other people and we come to church and we look at what they have. Oh, if I just was had their life, I'd be happy. Can I tell you what? You wouldn't know how to be happy with their life. Because each person has enough grace for your calling. God's given you your family, the people around you, because he entrusted you with them. So don't look back and say, man, I hate this life, Pastor. I, I, I envy what other people have, Pastor. I wish I just was someone else. Can I tell you what? God wants to get you understanding this morning that he created you just as you are. And yes, there's mistakes we make along the way. Yes, there's things we, we do to ourselves that cause this inner turmoil of being discontent. But that doesn't mean it's the end of our life. It just means we need to come back to the basics that God is enough. God fulfills those who are spiritually longing to be fulfilled. And that's, that's the division, I feel like, in a lot of people who struggle with being discontent. And that's sheer the basics. Why would God fulfill that dream in your life if you can't be content with who you are right now? Why, why would, why would, and, and this is, this is something I want to share to you because I used to pray this all the time when I, when I got saved, God, I just need more. And God would say, why would I give you more if you can't be diligent with what I've given you? Does that make sense? Learn to be content with who you are and what God has made you. Now, you can't be content and be diligent on your own. You need help. And that's why Paul's writing to this church saying, when I came, I was speaking to you as babes to try to get you to understand you need the help, and I need the help. 
But it doesn't come in, in everything around us. It comes through Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of things that we are not. Are you with me? So I ask you this morning, are you here this morning and you're struggling with envy? Are you discontent? Are you struggling in things of your life with envy? Maybe what someone else has, oh, pastor, I wish I was more like this or more like that. Can I tell you what? Then we need to understand this morning. God wants to fill us, but some of us aren't willing to be filled because we enjoy just being discontent. And I challenge you this morning as a pastor to you, my heart is longing for you to learn to be content in Christ. When I got married to my wife, I didn't get married and then one day wake up and, and, and say, babe, I'm, I'm discontent. We need to see other people. Can I tell you what? It was a promise I made to her that even through thick and thin, I'm willing to walk with you. And, and it's not, I'm not, there'll be days that it's not going to be easy, but we don't throw in the towel and give it up. And a lot of us as Christians, we don't realize when I get saved, I'm, 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 I'm in a way coming together with Jesus. And I'm learning to be content with all God has called me to be, has made me to be. I don't need to be like someone else. I don't need to be someone else. I'm good with who he's made me to be. And if I'm not good, then maybe this morning I need to open up my heart and ask God, where in my life am I struggling with this? And how can you help me be content with this life you've given me? Because some of us, man, we're still struggling with the basics, envy. Paul goes on and says, not only is there envy, but there's strife. Now, we look at these words and we kind of compare them and we'll kind of bounce them around a little bit. We look at them and we kind of say, well, isn't strife kind of the same as envy? Well, if you look at the definition, it's, it's a little similar. Bitter, sometimes violent conflict or what? Dissension. Now, I think it's pretty interesting that Paul would say first, you know, there's envy in the church. And then he says there's, there's this thing called strife. Now, strife can happen a lot in family. You ever notice that? You ever notice in family, like how many guys have family, which is all of you? Hint, hint. We all got family. You ever notice some of the worst conflicts are in family? You ever notice that? Sometimes it's because we're around them a lot. Sometimes it's because we're so close to them that we don't know how to, to do life with them, and we get conflict and, man, just bitter towards each other and, 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 and strife and, ah, uh, right? Some of the worst conflicts I've ever seen in my life have been with my own family. And it's interesting that it's the same way when it comes to the church. God's called the church to be a family. God's the head, and we're, we're the body, he says. And a lot of times I see a lot of strife in church that will not bring us together, but will separate us. And if we're not careful, we'll start looking and coming into church saying, well, this is just about me, 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 me. And then that's when strife begins. Because when you're so focused about you, you forget you're sitting next to someone else who's in maybe the same place or even a worse place than you are. And a mature Christian isn't coming into a place saying, what can I get out of it? A mature Christian saying, God, you've called me to be content with who I am, and now, God, I'm going to be in a place of giving out of what you're giving to me. Are you with me? See, these are the basics of Christianity. Learning you are who God says you are, and everything God gives you isn't for you. See, some of you guys, it's all mine. Me, 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 my, my, mine. And God says, well, I made heaven for people who understand this life isn't theirs, it's mine. See, a lot of us wouldn't fit into heaven because we, we don't learn how to, to, to live heaven-like here on earth. You with me? And I think it's important to really take a deep look at our life this morning and to really evaluate, are there places where we're discontent with our life? Is there places where strife we walk into this room, and we're so busy about me, 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 we forget this community is about we. Are you with me? How would you like it if I came up to your house, knocked on your door? Hey, it's Pastor Jared. All right. Hey, come on in. So I come on in. I sit down on your couch. And, and the first thing I say is, oh, let me tell you about my week. My week was a disaster. Man, my wife yelling at me all week, and then I get to the church, man. I left my keys at home, and I'm blacked out of the church. Then someone um, took my wallet, and I just start going for like 30 minutes. And you're just sitting there like, like just blown away. Like, did he just come into my house and trying to what? 
Some of us, we come into church and we're, we're so consumed with me, we forget it's, it's, it's we. Are you with me? Now, there's a place. That's why we do life groups will be starting back up in the fall. There's places where we create a community of people to get together to kind of really focus on the deep things that are going on. But I think if we're not careful, we get so consumed with, with me, you forget there's many people that have stuff going on. And as a mature Christian, if you want to step from a babe to a mature Christian, you're going to learn that strife is easily happening when it's me and not we. Are you with me? Now, maybe this morning you struggle with that. You say, Pastor, you, I go, I'm going through a lot. I, I, I Trust me. I understand. I may not be going through what you're going through, but we all have our struggles. And the Lord wants to teach you. If you can't first bring your struggle before God, why would you want to bring it to, for, to someone else? Are you with me? First, give it to the Lord and see if he won't first. Does that make sense? I had someone, I'll give you an example. I had someone come in a few weeks ago. They came up, and, and I said, hey, what's going on? And the first thing they said, they were like, Pastor, I got to tell you, this morning I woke up really bitter, really really kind of, in a way, envy, not, not the strife, but kind of more envy. And they were saying, Pastor, I woke up, and I just felt God prompted me to say, you know, God, I just, I, I hand this. And they said, for the next, you know, 30, 45 minutes, Pastor, while I was doing this, God just, his presence showed up. I was just releasing. And so they came up to me, and they said, I just need to let you know. I mean, I let all this and released all this. Is there anything you need me to do this morning? I just kind of was blown away because normally people are, you know, we're like, Pastor, let me tell you this, right? We're, we're so, like, consumed with me. When, when if you start your morning with Christ, you'll probably walk a different person throughout the day. You start, your, you start your morning with Jesus, get a little Jesus in your life. I guarantee you'll be a different person. Well, people, Pastor, people don't like me. Well, let me tell you what. Start with Jesus. He'll make you likable. He will. He'll turn that morning into joy. He'll turn that turmoil into peace. He'll turn that strife, if you give it over to him, he'll make you a different person. So Paul goes on to say, there's envy, there's strife, and this is the last one he says. And I find this one a lot, especially when it comes to when someone wants to start off following Jesus, is this last one's called division. Look what the meaning says, and then I'm going to explain. Division is the act of separating, right? We all know this. Something in the parts or the process of being separated. But then uh, this other definition kind of helped me kind of better clarify it. It's a disagreement between two or more groups, typically producing tension or what? Hostility. Now, when you get saved and you first start out on your journey with Christ, that's when I've noticed a lot of the biggest division comes because there's separation. You realize God set me apart from my old life. And with that division, sometimes as you get mature in Christ and you become a Christian for a longer period of time, the enemy starts to divide you even with the church. He starts to try to divide our church. And if we're not careful, division starts to creep in and we don't even realize we're a part of it. Division is, is, a, is, a, is a tough thing because division divides people. You ever notice that? And when we tell you one of, the, one of the cues that maybe you struggle with division is maybe if you struggle with this, this G word, it's, it's gossip. Man, that's a dangerous word, isn't it? That will divide a community fast. And you know, you know a lot of times what I've noticed about people who like to gossip is they haven't gone to the right ear. You know what I'm saying? Human ears are itchy, the Bible says. Oh, tell me more. Oh, tell me more. Oh, that's juicy. Tell me more. Oh, right? We get into Oh, tell me. We all can fall into it. But when you learn to go to the source of Jesus and say, God, there's a lot of things going on in my life. And God, I'm going to lay the stuff that wants to divide me down at your feet. And I'm going to come to you. Because, God, I don't want to be a baby Christian all my life. I don't want to struggle with envy. I don't want to struggle with strife. I don't want to struggle with division. God, I want to be a mature Christian, getting all that you have for me. You know, I was talking to my dad this week. A lot of you guys know him. If you don't, my dad pastors a church not far from here in Dundalk. And I, I was intrigued about his journey because I'm a second-generation pastor. Neither of my parents were saved. Um, well, obviously, they got saved because, you know, I'm a Christian now. But... Um, 
but they weren't saved growing up. My dad grew up in a, in a denominational church and, and kind of resented church because of a kind of, you know, it was very traditional. And so he kind of, you know, backslid. My mom, um, her parents were far from God, very far. And at a young age, um, a friend invited her to church, and she said, no, I'll never go to church. And, and one night, you know, she just felt um, she wanted to be a rebel because her parents, you know, at night would, you know, say, you got to come in for the night. So she snuck out the back door and, and went to church with her friend and en- ended up getting saved. Well, my dad, um, similar story, um, um, liked the girl, and the girl said, hey, if you like me, you got to go to church with me. And so my dad's like, all right, I'll take you up on that. So he went to church that night, going for the girl, ended up getting saved. Um, yeah, awesome story. He got saved at 18 as well, 18 years old. And so through that, I, I was asking my dad this week. I said, Dad, you know, you, know you, you weren't a Christian all of your life. And so tell me, like, the process. So he said, well, Jared, at 18 years old, I got saved. And he, he, he was going to Penn State. Penn State, um, he was going to Penn State College, and, and while he was there studying engineering, within the first couple months of him being saved, he felt like God was just taking him deeper. He was, he was in the Word, praying, just growing with his faith, leaps and bounds, plugged into it, the local church there, and, and he started a Bible study. That Bible study started to grow, I mean, to a lot, a lot of people. A couple hundred people were coming to his Bible study. He was working at a paper mill over the summer. He started putting little tracks in the papers that he would hand out to people. It was like this growth. within. And here's the crazy part. Within five years, he was plugged in the Bible college, and then I, and within six years, he was like a youth pastor. And I was like, that's crazy, Dad. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, there's a lot of people who miss out on their calling with God. Within six years, Dad, you were a pastor. Six years. And I said, Dad, how many people have been saved for maybe 18, 20 years, but they're still struggling with envy, strife, and division that they haven't fully... Now, I'm not saying that in six years you need to be a pastor, but I'm saying... Are you growing by leaps and bounds where people in your work, people in your family are affected by your walk with God? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if we stay babes, we don't impact the world. But mature Christians know what Christ has done for them. The sacrifice that was made. And with hands lifted, they say, God, I give you my life. I'm not looking to the opinions of others, nor am I looking to other people to fulfill me. God, you're what I need. You're what I want. Fulfill me. I was talking to a friend this week, and they say, you know, Jerry, as a young man, how do you battle a lot of times with all the things that come at you? He said, because I'm sure there's a lot of things and, and issues with people and, and, and that you deal with and, and, and conversations. How do you deal with all that? And I told him, I said, I don't have a counselor or a therapist or anything like that. I said, one of the greatest things I do is I learned every morning before I became your pastor to have a devotional time with the Lord that strengthens me. You want to know the secret to longevity with Jesus? It's fellowship with him. See, relationship is, is, is what we use a lot. Have a relationship with God. But can I tell you what? There's many of you guys that have relationships with, with people because you're related to them, but you don't have fellowship with them. You with me? You can be related to someone yet never talk to them. They can be your sister and you haven't spoken to them in years, right? A lot of us in our walk with God we quote, unquote, I have a relationship with him, but when's the last time you had fellowship with him? When's the last time you had fellowship with him? Well, what do you mean by that? When's the last time you really heard God speak to your heart? Ah, uh, he can't speak to me. Yeah, he can. When's the last time you had fellowship? See, mature Christians know how to have fellowship with Jesus. And it's not something we have to do. It's something I get excited and we get to do. Now, I bring this all together with this. Some of you guys need to step into being mature Christians. Other of you guys are still journeying in your walk with faith, in your walk with Christ, and you're still still learning about all this stuff, which is fine. As a church, we want to better equip you. That's why in life groups, when they start back up in the fall, we're thinking about that. If you're just getting saved, we want to start like kind of a new Christian life group to help you grow. What is the Bible? What does it mean? What is prayer? All these things, we want to try to answer those questions. But if you've been serving God for a while, you shouldn't have to be the same person you were six, seven years ago. Are you with me? We shouldn't be struggling with envy and strife and divisions among us. We shouldn't be about me. It should be about we. The kingdom of God is a we kingdom, not a me kingdom. You ain't getting to heaven and going up to God and saying, God, let me just tell you. God's going to say, there's a lot of people that want to tell me, but they didn't make it up here. You know why? It's a we kingdom. 
It's, a, it's not a me and my, it's a we. And this morning, I feel like there's maybe some of us that need to step from, from infancy in, in Jesus to growing. See, if you can't even wake up in the morning and spend time with the Lord, what's the basics? Are you with me? Pastor Jared should not have to bottle feed you. Now, some people in here do, and that's okay. But if you can serve in God for a while, you still need to be bottle fed. My, my, my concern is this. You're taking away from the people in this church who really need it. And my heart burns. Here's why. We should be growing by leaps and bounds because there's a lot of mature Christians in here. But are we really acting and being mature? Because there's a world that needs you. Do you understand there's a Carrollton Ridge community? Do you understand how, how many times we're in the news for shootings, drugs? A whole lot. Imagine if this church, all of us were mature enough to not just be with Christ, but live like him. Would this community not be impacted by the love of Christ? Would people not think twice before they considered maybe taking their life because there's a church that sits in the middle of all this craziness? That, man, we're not about me and my. We're about we. That's why we do adopt the blocks. That's why we have Sunday morning service, not for me and my. I don't come here for, for me and my wife. We come here for, for we. Are you with me? And if you can learn to come here for we, I'll tell you what, you'll start growing in Christ like you never knew you could grow because you're no longer just focused on you. You're focused on, man, there are people in our church, people in our community. But, man, I'm just concerned that some of us were still in infancy stage when God has called us to being mature. You struggle with division, you struggle with strife, you struggle with envy. You know what? I'm here to say that's okay, but this morning God wants to take it so he can help you because we all need it. Amen? Come on, will you bow and close your eyes this morning?